I was supposed to have made a sauce that looks like this. to be making epic nacho mac and cheese. Believe it or not, this video is not sponsored by HelloFresh. Instead, it is sponsored by Book of the Month. Book of the Month is a super popular and fast-growing online book service for readers. Their mission is to promote new and emerging authors and help readers discover books they love. Their team vets hundreds of books each month and gives readers their choice from a curated selection of new and early release titles. Book of the Month is risk-free so that you can skip any month, any time, and you will not be charged. Plus, they have the best price for new release fiction. I'll be doing a giveaway for the December books that they picked. The first one is in a Holidays, which is a story about a woman who gets caught in a time loop in a holiday rom-com. This Close to Okay, which is a contemporary fiction about how a near tragedy brings two lonely strangers to save each other's lives. The Wife of Stairs, which is a southern gothic thriller about a rich husband, his young fiance, and unanswered questions about his missing wife. The Office of Historical Corrections, which is a collection of short stories about contemporary American life. And People Like Her, which is a thriller book about an influencer and her creepy follower. Giveaway links will be in the description below, but if you want the books guaranteed and and right away. There's actually a special deal that they're doing right now where if you use read with Cindy 5 as the promo code, you can get your first box for $5. Now let's start cooking, kind of. And I'll be talking about all the books I read in the month of November. So the first step is to boil some salted water, which I'm doing in the background right now. Then the next step is to dice some poblano peppers. I'm gonna go ahead and tempt that while telling you the first book that I read this month, which was Girl Serpent Thorn. This is a YA fantasy that is a kind of Sleeping Beauty retelling. I mean, it didn't really follow it. Not exactly the Disney retelling, but it is about a princess who must hide away from the rest of the kingdom because she was cursed when she was young to be poisonous at her touch. So any living thing that she touches, whether it's a flower or a human being, that thing will die. Which if you think about it, kind of makes her like the best player in the game of tag ever because nobody would be allowed to touch her and she would automatically win. That's pretty much it in terms of the benefits though. <laughs> like her life kind of sucks because she can't touch anybody, she can't hug anyone, she can't kiss anyone. She's very touch deprived, just like me during quarantine. And my coochie is also probably poisonous. So we have a lot to relate to. She spent her life hiding away. Nobody really sees her that often. She has a twin brother who's kind of like the glory child. He's the one who's gonna be the king. He's the one that's gonna get married. He's gonna have a perfect life while she is kind of just hidden in the shadows. The plot begins when the royal family is keeping a demon in the dungeons below. And that demon holds the knowledge that she is looking for, which is a way to break the curse. Her mom told her not to bother to go down there and don't even bother like talking to the demon because demons are supposed to be super tricky and they always lie. And she's just like, you can't trust these hoes. But the main girl is like, no, I need to find out for myself because I'm tired of being a touch deprived bitch. I don't want to live like Reed with Cindy anymore. She knows the demon can tell her how to break the curse because the reason why she got it was actually because because her mom was cursed by a demon a long time ago. And so the demon that had did that to her was like the same type of demon as the one in the dungeon below. So she goes ahead and sneaks off into the dungeon to try to talk to this demon. She finds out that in order to obtain the knowledge that demon wants, she has to obtain this item that's valuable to the demon. And so she sets off on this little journey. She joins like this other dude too, who's like in love with her. And he accepts her for who she is. Like he found out that she, cannot touch anyone without killing them. And he's just like, you know what? I'm cool with that. And that is all I can say for the general synopsis. I do want to talk more about the relationships because romance was a big center in the story. And I have a lot of thoughts about the love triangle that happens in the book. If you want to come into the story and be surprised by what kind of love triangle this is, then you should skip ahead. Otherwise, I'm gonna go ahead and talk about it right now. So what initially appears to be the love interest in the beginning of the book is this soldier guy that helps her out throughout the story and I liked him because he seemed kind of hot so I was like down to clown but at the same time I knew I couldn't trust him because he was so into her and I was like why are you so eager bitch hmm what is your intentions? So I figured there had to be something more about him, but either way, he definitely wasn't gonna be endgame because any characters who are automatically attracted to each other, like from the very beginning, they probably won't end up together. That's just not how fiction works. But I thought it was sweet how he was so smitten by her and wanted to court her and how he didn't care about her curse and didn't judge her for that. I think I just like the Sims. That's what it's about. Also, he's a soldier and I kind of like the whole bodyguard trope. So I was into him, but here's the weird thing. 
The demon that she meets underground in the dungeon is a female demon. And even though she and that soldier dude had like a good thing going on, they were like, in a flirtation ship, they were courting each other. The moment that she first interacted with the demon, I was like, hmm, she obviously has a flirtation ship going on with a soldier, but why do I feel this chemistry between this girl and the demon that her family has imprisoned? And I was like, hmm, don't get your hopes up, Cindy. You might be reading too far into it. You might just be projecting, but I couldn't shake it off. There just seemed to be something really gay going on. Nothing explicitly gay happened, but I just had a feeling, but I didn't want to get my hopes up because I had no idea if the book was sapphic or not. And the thing is, if you look the book up on Goodreads, you can pretty much confirm whether a book has an LGBT plus relationship because that will be one of the tags in the sidebar. But I didn't do that because I've been picking up books without really reading about them beforehand. So I was going to come into this blind and I was like, no, I want to figure this out for myself. I want to be a fucking detective and try to figure this shit out because I know some gay shit is going on. I can feel it in my bones. And so they had chemistry and their first interaction with each other, even though the demon was a prisoner and nothing actually romantic happened in the conversation. But I just had a feeling in my gut. And then the second time they talked to each other, right before the main girl has to leave, the demon snatches one of her gloves that she always wears so that she doesn't accidentally kill people she snatches the gloves and then she's like I'll give this back to you next time we meet and I'm just like ma'am why would you steal the girl's gloves if you weren't gay again that's not a gesture that means you're gay but it felt gay you know what I mean I, I just feel like you have to read it to understand what I'm talking about but I was just like I'm on to you, bitch. I know what you're trying to do. And then they're telling each other, like, we're nothing more than tools to each other. I'm like, yeah, right, bitch. I'm on to you. I may have chosen to no longer label myself and my sexuality, but that doesn't mean that I don't have an intuition for this shit. And my radar was just pinging, pinging all over the place. So basically, as you can tell, this ended up being a love triangle between two girls and one guy, except the other girl and the guy were into the same girl not only that but she is also in a love triangle between two demons so not only is she stuck between a hot guy and a hot girl she also can be a monster fucker good for her dude I was like, damn, you really live in the life right now okay so once the pot is boiling you dump the noodles in Next, we are going to thinly slice the scallions. We're also going to mince some garlic. I ended up not really liking the guy, which is a shame because again, I really did think that he was hot material in the beginning, but he turned out to be such a darkling wannabe. Once he reveals his true colors instead of being a simp, I was just so over the male character's tortured shtick because I feel like that happens so often in YA books and I don't care for it. Society has progressed past the point of being attracted to tortured men. Stop trying to be a brooding love interest and just get therapy like the rest of us. And his evilness is actually counterproductive in making me wanting to root for him because instead he'll be telling the main character like after he fucks shit up across the kingdom, he tells her, I want you to execute your brother. And I'm like, dude, that's her brother, read the room. But at this point, it doesn't even make sense why she would be attracted to him. But that's the thing. The main girl is the most wishy-washy bitch I have ever <laughs> read in my life. She goes back and forth so many times throughout the book in a way that it doesn't make sense. I can kind of get it in the beginning because like, yeah, you had a good thing going on with a dude and he was hot, but then the demon girl is also pretty hot. That's valid, that's understandable. But then once he starts like threatening to kill your family and like committing genocide, I don't know, I think that's kind of a deal breaker for me. I feel like that would just turn off my coochie and I wouldn't be into it. So he's just like, I'm gonna force you to kill your own brother. And then if you make me angry, I'm gonna kill your entire family in front of you. And then she's just like, damn. That sucks. He could still be a good guy though. I mean, I don't know. Like we still have a good connection. You know, I, I just don't know. And the guy is an idiot too because she clearly doesn't trust him and she clearly has, you know, hard eyes for the demon girlfriend. But he still keeps her around. And then when he catches her and all these like little lies, he's like, man, 
Can I trust her even though she's repeatedly lied to my face several times? I just don't know. So in a way, they kind of deserve each other and I think the demon girlfriend deserves better. That's the real takeaway that I have for the story. So the reason why the protagonist is so wishy-washy is because I believe the author is trying to give her some kind of internal struggle where she has to choose between kind of like the dark side of her powers. She is poisonous to the touch. Does she succumb to that dark part of her where she thinks she might be evil after all? Or does she choose the good side and tries to do better for herself? And I think this is a very common dilemma that protagonists face whenever they have like a bad boy antagonist character. Next, I'm gonna combine some red pepper cream into a small bowl. Here's the thing, I never buy it whenever the protagonist is uncertain about which side to join and whether they're secretly evil deep down. This has happened for this book, the Grisha trilogy, probably tons of others. Because I'm like, dude, if you were actually evil, you wouldn't be so wishy-washy, right? Like you would already pick a side right away. You wouldn't be like, oh, I don't know. Evil people aren't like that. They're not indecisive. She literally did not do one evil thing in the entire book. But the whole time she's like, oh my God, what if I'm a monster? And I'm like, no bitch, you're Gabby Hanna. So what if I'm the monster? You're a Libra, cause you're indecisive as fuck. Then I'm gonna add salt and pepper to the red cream. It says that you should add water to it, but I'm not gonna do that cause I'm tired of the main girl being thirsty and not being able to choose a love interest. It's so easy. Obviously you go with the demon girlfriend. I get that the soldier guy is hot, but once he threatens to commit genocide, I don't know how you can move on from that in a relationship. Like, I just don't. Okay, so while the pasta starts cooking, I am going to start frying up the poblano. What I like to do once I find out that I didn't dice my veggie properly is that I like to dice them myself with the spatula while they're in the pan. Oh, shit. Okay, the pan is getting too loud, so I think I'm just gonna focus on cooking and then we'll have a mukbang afterwards. Cooking tutorial, you add the poblano peppers for like five minutes, then you add butter, then you add scallion whites, then you add garlic. What I like to do sometimes after I add in all the ingredients is realize I forgot to add one other ingredient, so then I haphazardly try to add everything together and hope I wasn't too late. Then when my pan burns, I like to scratch all the burnt parts and hope I don't get cancer from eating this. And then you add a shit ton of cream cheese and just hope for the best. And then when you also realize you forgot to chop garlic, then you quickly add that in last minute. So I was supposed to have made a sauce that looks like this. I don't know what the fuck this is. Okay, this is starting to look more like a sauce. Ooh la la, so elegant. Then you start adding cheddar cheese to it. Then you try to scrape the noodles out of the pot because you were an idiot and you left the noodles in for too long and now they're stuck at the bottom of the pot. It fits. Then you crush the tortilla chips and sprinkle them over your mac and cheese. And then you top it with an even layer of Mexican cheese. And then you drizzle it with the hot sauce cream that you have. And then because we are healthy, we add some scallion greens. Here is what the recipe looks like. And now get prepared for my final creation. Bam! So what if I'm the monster that's been here all along? We did it. We made something somewhat edible. The next book that I read was Minor Feelings by Kathy Hong Park. This is a nonfiction book that is a series of essays where Kathy talks about the Asian American experience. In the book, she introduces the concept of minor feelings, which she defines as when American optimism contradicts your own reality, when you believe the lies you're told about your own racial identity. When I read this book, the beginning resonated so much with my experience experience as an Asian American. I actually connect minor feelings to a way of gaslighting yourself where you think, oh, well, things should be okay. And it's not that bad. I'm probably just making it a bigger deal than it is. It's something that I've also talked to my therapist before where she straight up pointed out to me that I was minimizing my own feelings. So I felt really seen to read all of that in her book because it made me realize that I wasn't the only one who felt that way. As an Asian American, you are pretty much an invisible minority in America. The discrimination and racial bias that you deal with is not as overt 
or obvious as discrimination towards black people. It's something that is more insidious and I think because it doesn't fit into the mainstream way that we process racism, it doesn't seem like it should be a thing. But then we're kind of left with these very downtrodden feelings and we don't know what to do with it. I'm gonna read a few of the quotes that really stood out to me. Asians lack presence. Asians take up apologetic space. We don't even have enough presence to be considered real minorities. We're not racial enough to be token. We're so post-racial, we're silicon. Our feelings are overreactions because our lived experiences of structural inequity are not commensurate with their diluted reality. She talks a little bit about her own experiences and there's a question that she asked that I thought pretty much spoke something that I constantly think of a lot. What if my cannibalizing ego is not a racial phenomenon, but my own damn problem? I felt this a lot when I was living in Virginia and I worked with a predominantly white male workplace. And so many times I felt like I was being underestimated or being dismissed. And it was frustrating for me to grapple with that because I couldn't tell if it was because of racism or if it was because I am genuinely incompetent. Like I think, what if it has nothing to do with me being an Asian woman? What if it's just because I'm a shitty designer? Even now I feel that way about my place on booktube too, because I'm not a stranger to criticisms and people not liking me on here. Booktube is a very predominantly white platform, especially when you look at the bigger creators who have my sub count. But there's a specific type of language that gets used when criticizing me, like saying that I try too hard to be not like other girls. And whenever I see something like that, I think, do people assume that being myself, which is a loud, brash, annoying Asian girl, is considered not like other girls because I'm not that idea of being a sweet and quiet and girly Asian girl because I have exhibited qualities that are not those things that you would associate with Asian girls. Or is it because I'm genuinely an annoying bitch, <laughs> you know? So it's hard to tell. I think it's important to be mindful of that, especially if other people who are in similar positions as me do not receive the same experiences or criticisms. So much to think about, but also very depressing to think about. When I hear the phrase, Asians are next in line to be white, I replace the word white would disappear. Asians are next in line to disappear. We are reputed to be so accomplished and so law abiding, we will disappear into this country's amnesiac fog. We will not be the power, but become absorbed by power. Not share the power of whites, but be stooges to a white ideology that exploited our ancestors. This country insists that our racial identity is beside the point, that it has nothing to do with being bullied or passed over for promotion or cut off every time we talk. Our race has nothing to do with this country, even, which is why we're often listed as other in polls and why we're hard to find in racial breakdowns on reported rape or workplace discrimination or domestic abuse. I think what's frustrating about being an invisible minority and one that is associated to be supposedly successful, more successful than other minorities, is that one, it makes white people dismiss your own experiences because of the stereotype that Asians are successful and that they don't deal with poverty or any other issues. But the worst part of it all is that other people of color truly don't understand. That's what I've noticed about just certain people that I've seen like online. The internet in particular loves to play oppression Olympics. And when you play it like that, based on your very shallow knowledge of the Asian American experience, Asians would be last place. And what's frustrating is that I start to believe that too. And I'm like, hmm, maybe they are right. Maybe my problems aren't actually problems. And that can be very depressing to go through. So I like that this author was able to articulate those feelings of shame and gaslighting and quiet solitude and loneliness that comes with being an Asian American in a country that doesn't necessarily see Asians as a minority. By the second half of the book, I feel like it wasn't serving me what I really liked from the first half. The rest of the book dives into these personal anecdotes from herself and from people that she knew in college. I felt like they were out of place. It didn't have the same level of reflection that I really liked from the first half of the book. And if she were gonna add them, I wish she would at least expand upon like what the takeaways are 
from those experiences. Okay, I'm getting full, so we're gonna stop eating here. After that, I read a YA fantasy called Spin the Dawn. This is a book that is described as Project Runway meets Mulan because it follows a story about a girl who dreams of becoming a tailor, but due to society being shitty, a tailor is really seen as like a man's job and she's just supposed to be like a pretty little housewife. But the plot begins when the royal messenger comes to request her father to come into the palace and try out to be the imperial tailor and compete with a bunch of other tailors to see who is the best clothes maker to make all these pretty little outfits for the royal family and her father is not in good condition to do so. So she poses as his son to go take his place which is a really big risk because if she were exposed to be a girl the bitch is dead. She goes to the palace and she finds out that she's not the only tailor there because she has to compete against 11 other men for the job. And so that's where the Project Runway part comes in because it's like a little competition. Pretty much halfway through the book, it shifts into this journey narrative where she has to embark on kind of like a road trip with this dude who's basically her love interest. And she has to collect all of these magical artifacts so that she can sew her dresses. And it just seemed out of place because the way that it was framed in the beginning and in the synopsis is that it was going to be this rigorous competition where she has to prove herself to be the best tailor. But then halfway through the book, now she's on a road trip with her love interest and it becomes very heavily centered on romance. I usually find that romance is what makes me enjoy a book even more. But this was a case where I didn't really care for the couple because they felt pretty vanilla to me and they also felt very unnecessary. There was no reason for her to have a love interest other than for practical reasons, which is the fact that he literally helped her in every single direction she went in. He would give her all the answers, he would give her all the clues, but then that's not really a good thing, right? Because you don't want the dude to be doing everything for you, especially if this is like a Mulan retelling where she's supposed to prove herself despite her gender. So that seemed kind of counterproductive. It seemed to dilute the other possible themes that the book could have conveyed. I think there could have been a lot of potential to explore deeper themes of being an Asian woman, of being interested in a trade that is associated with men because back then tailoring was something that was a man's job. And even aside from those themes, it still could have been a really fun story if she had truly leaned into the competition aspect because if she's comparing this to Project Runaway, reality shows are so juicy. You could have so much drama, so much sabotage, and I feel like we barely got any of that and that was kind of a shame because I definitely think it could have been way juicier with a deep message to top it all off. And then the last book that I read is There There by Tommy Orange. This is a fictional novel that follows 12 indigenous characters who all live in Oakland. When I picked this book up, I knew it was an indigenous book, but I didn't know that it fully took place in Oakland. And that was a pleasant surprise for me because I'm actually from the Bay Area. It was cool to see them literally going on the same BART train that I always go on, stopping at the same cities that I always stop at, and just seeing the city through their eyes. I think that a lot of times people associate indigenous characters or stories as something that is more mystical, where they are on old reservations and it's super old school. And I really like how this is showing like a modern day look at indigenous people today in the inner cities that I'm from and how they deal with identity and displacement. How do they deal with being in a place that they belong to, but it has changed so drastically. So all the 12 characters have pretty different lives, but the fun part is seeing their lives intersect with one another, especially when it leads to the climax towards the end. So I'm not gonna spoil what happens, but it's a pretty dramatic climax. Like some shit goes down. So many of the characters' stories are different from one another and they all deal with various issues like rape, addiction, alcoholism, suicide, domestic violence, just a ton of other issues that unfortunately statistically tend to plague indigenous people, which is not a surprise considering all the shit they've been through. That's intergenerational trauma for you, baby. Yeah, it's really depressing, <laughs> but I think it was done well. I think 
really the main thing for me that keeps me from fully embracing the story and being like completely immersed and in love with it is I think I would have enjoyed this book more if it focused on a few central characters instead of trying to write about 12 different people. When you narrow down your focus to a few central characters, that gives more time for us to really know the characters fully and have them be fully developed. It gives us more time to dive deeper into the issues and themes that the story explores. And also, I'm an idiot, so I can't keep up with 12 characters. It was very hard for me to differentiate characters after being introduced to like the 10th person. And I wish that there had been a more narrow focus on just a few people because I think it would have been more impactful to really go all in on a few people. And there are some characters where like, I really wanted to know so much more about them or see like what would happen to them. And then we would get sidetracked by like a completely new character. And I'm like, dude, I already got invested in this one. Don't make me move on to a new one. And that's pretty much it for all the books I read in the month of November. Thanks for watching me cook very badly. Go ahead and unsubscribe from my channel. Goodbye. Well, that's the way it goes